Hey, I'm Kev Care, Mr. Kern. Welcome to Power Oversteer and IndyCar Series Awareness Month, aka the month of May. I remember my first Awareness Month back in 2004. It was sunny for the whole month until the great day. The threat of rain meant mixed strategies, and when the rain came, a guy called Buddy the Rice won the race. The team owners, the Rahuls, and the Lettermans were very happy. While Buddy drank the milk. Hopefully, he wasn't lactose intolerant. But since that great day, I have become aware of the Verizon IndyCar series and followed it for more than a decade now. And hopefully, this month can make everyone aware of what the IndyCar series is and follow this great series as well. So let's begin our note back at April's races in the Verizon IndyCar series, beginning with the inaugural Grand Prix of Louisiana held around the NOLA Motorsports Park. Unfortunately though, it was very much a case of rain spoiling the parade. So the tale of the Indy Grand Prix of Louisiana, the inaugural event held around the NOLA Motorsports Park. It was a dry Friday, at least. It was very nice, and you know, like Chip Ganassi were going to be challenging with Scott Dixon in particular. But then the rains came for qualifying, and in first qualifying, we had seen when Pablo Montoya and Harry Kershaw knocked out as they spun. But then in second qualifying, the thunder and lightning came, and that, and we had to cancel qualifying. And so the grid was set by entrant points. So basically, the racer. Race result from St. Petersburg, which meant Ron Pablo Montoya got pole ahead of Will Power, Tony Kinnan, Heyo Castro Neves, Simon Pagano, Sebastian Bohr, Day in 6th, Ryan Hunter in 7th, Jack Hawksworth in 8th, Luca Therapy in 9th, and Marco Andretti rounded out the top 10. A lucky break for the Penske pair of Castro Neves and Montoya, no doubt. And the race was just chaotic again as it started off in wet conditions and then dried out about for third of the way through it and it was dry tyres for the rest of the race but still there were rivers on the track particularly on the back straight on the front straight as well and some water just stayed in the inside of some curbs and yeah it just meant very tricky conditions for the drivers and it definitely looked like it for most of them at least. As this was also a time race due to the weather conditions so only 47 laps were completed of the race distance and to tell you how chaotic this race is there were 21 green flag laps which lasted for 32 minutes compared to 26 caution laps which lasted for around 75 minutes of the hour and 47 long race 47 minute long race even that was that's pretty terrible reading for IndyCar unfortunately and so it was Montoya who led away from the first lap till lap 13 until that period where you could change onto the dry tyres. Kirsten never stayed out of that longer and so Montoya regained the lead on lap 15. Before the Penske pair appeared to have seen a number of drivers pit such as Tony Kanon and Ryan hunter A were the first couple that I recall pitting for the dry tyres. And in Kanon's case he spun later on in the lap and was lucky to not hit anyone when he rejoined the track. And so on that 15 onwards, we saw Montoya lead the race on the trying track. And we also seen further down the field, Harry Castro Neves kind of tap Francesco Diaconi into a spin on turn one. The Delcon driver went round, but Castro Neves got away with just a warning. This is after Graham Rahill was given a penalty for doing the same thing to Charlie Kimball at St. Petersburg. And we always complain about penalty consistency, but... That was one of the worst cases of inconsistency we've ever seen in the IndyCar series, right there. And so Montoya had led into the fourth caution of the race on that 32 when he pitted, when Kershaw Evers pitted, and the likes of James Hinchcliffe and James Jakes for Smith Peterson Motorsports stayed out, and the likes of Simone Di Silvestro as well for Andretti Autosport. They just stayed out and gambled to, with their fuel and hoping to stick until the end and grab an unlikely result. But as I said, this race was littered with cautions and the first one of those was on lap 16 when Gary Chavez spun in turn 4. But then hero of the year, this shirted guy, I'm not sure he was a marshal or not, but he just pushed 
the Brian Herter Autosport car back onto the track. Unfortunately, Chavez stalled the car and brought out the caution, and that lasted for four laps. And then on lap 21, we saw contact at the back of the field on the restart as James Jakes just lost control of his car in the last corner. But then there was Jack Hawksworth right behind him and unfortunately Hawksworth had nowhere to go but the tyre barrier in turn 13. And Jakes continued going without any damage actually, you know, like got much damage to his car anyway. Then on that 28 we saw Stefano Coletti for Gay V Racing have a magnificent spin down the front straight on a restart as underpower he just lost the car and miraculously didn't collect anyone but went into the tie barrier and didn't even damage his car that much. He continued running in the end and finished 17th in the end. But then the critical caution on that 32 when we saw Sage Cohn go into the Gravel in turn 5, he just spun, the young American really struggled with conditions as he brought out the next caution on that 41 when he spun in turn 13. And at this time we had seen that James Henshaw Gamble might even work with all these cautions, and indeed it did, and it was confirmed on lap 44 when we brought out the final caution, the sixth caution of the race when... Simon Pagenaud was going down the inside of Ryan hunter Ray towards turn 3, while Sebastian Bourdais was on the outside. hunter Ray seemed to just misjudge the gap between him and Bourdais and just squeezed Pagenaud onto the grass, and the Frenchman was out of control, and unfortunately took out his fellow Frenchman, Sebastian Bourdais, and hunter Ray as well. And so the race ended under caution after an hour and 47 minutes. After 47 laps, it was a Honda win, for James Hinchcliffe, his first win with his new team, Smith Peter Smoke Sports, at least in the Verizon IndyCar Series, ahead of Harry Castroneves, who's been a very lucky boy all weekend in Nola, and James Jakes finished third, rounding out a great race in the end for Smith Peterson Motorsports. In fourth, it's Simona Di Silvestre, ahead of one Pablo Montoya, in fifth, who even made a pass round Will Power to grab that top five spot. Tony Canard was sixth. Of the eventful race, Will Power in 7th, Graham Ray Hall 8th, Joseph Newgarden in ninth, and Luca Therapy rounded out the top 10. Head of Scott Dixon, Carlos Munoz, Marco Andretti, Charlie Kimball, Chavez, you know, returned to 15th in the end. Head of Carlos Hurtas, Stefano Caletti, Sage Kerwam after an eventful race. And then the retirements of Hunter Ray, Simon Pergino, Sebastian Borde, Takuma Sato on that 22. Francesco Diaconi on that 23 of that contact with Castro Neves and Jack Hawksworth as well. As there were penalties on the in the end for Sage Kerm, who had 25 second penalty added to his race time, and for Carl Sertus as well for entering a closed pit. So he had 25 seconds headed to his race time, and for Kerm, it was due to a pit speed violation. And there were even more penalties being handed out after the race, such as to Ryan Hunter A for avoidable contact for causing that final caution of the race. He was penalised three points in the driver's standings and placed on probation for three races. Francesco Giacconi of Del Coin Racing was fined at ten thousand dollars and placed on probation for six races due to hitting a crew member in pit lane. He locked up coming into the pits and slid into the crew member who was fortunately not seriously harmed. We also saw Marco Andretti fined five hundred dollars for not keeping his helmet visor down during a pit stop. And we also saw Dale Coyne fined five hundred dollars for a crew member fooling without his visor down. We also saw Andretti Autosport fined five hundred dollars for failing to attend to a tire during a pit stop and for keeping equipment outside of the excited pit area. It kind of just went out I guess on during a pit stop and KVSH racing were fined $500 for a crew member going over the wall without a helmet on. So it's quite an eventful Indy Grand Prix of Louisiana. It was a bit less eventful though in the next race as the championship went to the coast of California and the sun of Long Beach. And for round three of the championship, the Verizon IndyCar Series went to the iconic Long Beach Street Circuit for the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach. And while it's a race that didn't feature much action out on track, it was definitely a race that revolved around the strategy and it got a bit maligned for that. It was definitely a race that the IndyCar Series needed after a couple of messy and chaotic 
races to begin the season with. And grabbing pole was Heyo Kashinevis for Penske with a new that record of 106.6294, head of his teammate Juan Pablo Montoya. Scott Dixon was third ahead of Ryan Hunter Ray, who was the only Honda driver in the Firestone Fast 6 in qualifying, and he qualified fourth. Simon Pagano was fifth ahead of Joseph Newgarden, Tony Kanan, Graham Ray Hall, Sebastian Bourdais, and Marco Andretti rounded out the top 10 on the grid, head of Sebastian Cerveja in his first outing, and in the number 8 Chip Ganassi car replacing Sage Karam. And it was Cash who led the opening 29 laps of the race as he was just holding off Dixon in the beginning as the Chip Ganassi driver went past Ron Pablo Montoya at the start. And we saw only caution of the race on that five for four laps the caution lasted as we had debris in turn nine after Gabby Chavez, the Brian Herter Autosport driver, made a lazy dive down the inside of Takuma Sato's AJ Foyt machine and just took bits of his front wing off. And yeah, that's another Honda front wing that was damaged during this race. And from that 30 to 33, saw Jack Hawksworth lead, but it was behind him where the action was happening as Harry Kirchner has got held in the pits and this allowed Scott Dixon to jump him and grab the kind of de facto lead ahead of the Pensy driver who was just held up by I believe Tony Kanon in the pit so you know the Brazilian it effectively helped his Chip Canessi teammate there to win the race in the end as Dixon led from that 34, 34 to 53 before Cachanavas grabbed the lead again for a couple of laps and then Bourdais led, for, led lap 56 but it's Dixon leading from that 57 to the end has the Kiwi led 44 laps to grab his first win round Long Beach in the Verizon IndyCar Series after winning there in the Indy Lights Championship back in 2000. And he won ahead of Helio Castroneves with Juan Pablo Montoya rounding out the podium after holding off his teammate Simon Pagano in the closing few laps. Also holding off Tony Kanan, who finished fifth, and Sebastian Bourdais wasn't far behind in another impressive six for the KVSH racing driver. Joseph Newgarden finished seventh, but maybe disappointed as he just lost out in the last round of stops after nicking Nike was going to get a top five for CFH racing. Marco Andretti was eighth and the top Honda finisher ahead of Carlos Munoz, and Sebastian Svejer getting a solid top ten in his Chip Ganassi car. Graham Rahill was 11th ahead of James Hinchcliffe. Ryan Hunter A dropped down to 13th. Jack Hawks were 14th. Charlie Comeball 15th. Gabby Shever 16th. And Connor Daly 17th for Dale Coyne Racing. This was after Rocky Moran Jr. was meant to be in that Dale Coyne seat. The 35 year old American he hadn't driven a single seater for a decade. But unfortunately, he got injured in practice after tangling with Carlos Munoz in turn one and breaking his thumb. So it was daily he was on hand to step into that seat at the last moment out qualify Francesco Diaconi in qualifying and in the race just out racing by miles and get a very solid 17th header to Kuma Sato, James Jakes, Will Power in 20th and this is because after the first round of stops he just stalled in the pit lane he couldn't put in the clutch in time to you know stop the anti-stall kicking in and this also affected Luca Firpi who, had, who also had the same problem and so they could only finish 20th and 22nd in the end. Francesco Diaconi was 21st and Stefano Coletti, well, he got the fastest of the race on that 56 with a 108.0969. He just dropped back with issues of a gearbox issue, I believe. And so he finished 11 laps down in the end and last after qualifying last as well for the race. So not a weekend to remember for the KV racing driver. But overall, it was a very solid and decent Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach in my eyes, but it was going about to get better round Barber Motorsports Park and the Grand Prix of Alabama. Oh, this is the race IndyCar had wanted since the beginning of the season. Round four held round the Barber Motorsports Park for the Honda Indy Grand Prix of Alabama. And in qualifying, it was a familiar story as Penske grabbed pole with Helio Kashinevis ahead of Will Power for the fourth race in a row. It was an all Penske front row and a Penske pole. In third it was Simon Pagano ahead of Scott Dixon, Joseph Newgarden and Tony Kanon as no Honda was in the Firestone for six. Sebastian Bourdais was seventh with the top Honda in qualifying, Graham Rahal in eighth, Luca Fiopi in ninth and James Hinchcliffe rounding out the top ten. 
And it so it began with Hokesh and Nevis leading from the off as he swerved a, swerved a bit to hold off his teammate Will Power. He kind of blocked Simon Pagano and this allowed the likes of Joseph Newgarden make moves up the field. And by the end of the lap one, Newgarden was up to second as he made a marvellous move down Will Power in the penultimate corner. Third about we also seen Sebastian Bourdais make up a couple of places with a wonderful move around the outside of Tony Canon as well in turn two. And Scott Dixon as well actually in turn two. In turn one it was Tony Canon. So in the early part we had seen some marvellous racing and at the front though it's Cashino is leading for Simon Pagano took the lead on that 19. The New Garden led on that 22 has it looked like it was working out for SFH Racing and the young American to maybe grab the first win in the Verizon IndyCar series. Then on that 35 Graham Ray Hall led due to a different strategy as we were in our second caution period of the race. Our first caution was on lap 20 due to debris from an incident involving Will Power and Takuma Sato. Power was rejoining from the pit lane but in turn two he just didn't see Takuma Sato in the inside of the corner and just drove into the AJ Foyt driver. I'm not sure if Sato is cursed this season, but people seem to be driving into him there right and centre. So Power, of course, got a drive-through penalty for avoidable contact, and even though he was a bit angry with that in, in the race, it, it seemed on his team radio, but it's definitely a justified penalty nonetheless. Then we saw the next caution on that 34 due to Stefano Coletti. He was former GP2 driver and it seemed like the habits from GP2 have kind of dying hard with him as he just dived down the inside of James Jakes in turn 5 very late on the brakes, way too late on the brakes and just punted the Englishman into a spin it seems some fine moves that race but I'm not sure I'll put that in a list of one of them and so Coletti got a drive through penalty for avoidable contact and on that 40 this is after Sage Cohen was put to the back of the field for pit speed violation on that 37 under the caution so on that 39 it went green again as we saw graham rahel and also james hinchcliffe right up there on alternate strategies and hinchcliffe led the race on that 47 Sebastian bordet led the race on that 48 and when pablo montoya led the race on that 50 as the championship leader started the race in 15th was kind of making the meal of it to go up the order even though he made one of the moves of the race on that 37 when he followed Jack Hawksworth past Charlie Kimball in turn 7 when Kimball thought, hey, Hawksworth is past me, I'll try and get the corner. But no, Montoya was right there and was very aggressive making his way past as Kimball kind of went onto the grass. It seemed an avoidance of Montoya on the corner exit and out of turn 8. So at the front then we had Joseph Newgarden lead on lap 51 before Scott Dixon led on lap 63. And then Ray Hall took the lead again on lap 65 as he saw 10 lead changes this race with 8 different leaders, a new record for this race. But in the end it was Joseph Newgarden leading from lap 70 till the end as the young American finally got his first win in the Verizon IndyCar series and a first win for the merged CFH Racing team and what a win it was from the american hopefully this is the first of many maybe even this season but certainly for his verizon indycar series career second was graham ray hill he was the mover and shaker of this race or the staken shaker of this race as he moved up the field and in the last stint on fresher tires against the likes of Ryan Hunter Ray, Will Power and Scott Dixon he was making moves left right and centre and got past Dixon on the final lap of the race to grab second and maybe with another lap he would have taken Newgard and he was just a one second behind the his fellow American at the end but Ray Hall was top Honda all weekend and just justly got a penalty got a podium even not a penalty as he just continued his strong start to the season dixon continued his remarkable record at barber finishing on the podium for every race round here as he finished third but he's still not got a win round here strangely will powers fourth ahead of hunter rain fifth and carlos munoz in sixth after qualifying in 22nd great recovery from him in the race and the andretti boys as well with the strategy James Hinchcliffe was seven ahead of Sebastian Bourdais. Simon Pagano, who seems to have the one that pace in Spensky, but it doesn't seem like it's coming together in the races for him. He finished ninth ahead of Marco Andretti, who finished tenth once again in a race. He seems to finish tenth or qualify tenth quite a lot this season already. 
Luca Fiopi was 11th ahead of Charlie Kimball. Tony Kanon won Pablo Montoya in 14th, were only due to his teammate Hayao Koshinev's running out of fuel on the last lap of the race and finishing behind him. Gabby, Gabby Chavez was 16th, Takuma Sato 17th, Sage Kohm 18th, Stefan Kerti 19th. Rodolfo Gonzalez, who stepped into that number 18 Dell coin car, it really does seem to be kind of a roulette who gets that seat, it seems. And he finished 20th in his debut Indy car race. 21st was Jack Horser, 22nd James Jakes, and 23rd was Francesco Diaconi, who was a lap down along with Jakes, the only two lapped guys in the field. Very competitive race round Barber, and what a race it was as he saw the fast out of the race from Ryan Hunter A on lap 16 with 109.7 while pole for cash numbers with 107.1 and just like after the Grand Prix of Louisiana there's been lots of penalties announced after the Grand Prix weekend of Alabama has Chevrolet have been deducted 20 manufacturer championship points for a non-minor engine repair made to the engine of Sage Coram's number 8 entry of course Chevrolet did this to all of the other entries after the Grand Prix of St. Petersburg also, oh, Team Penske have been fined a total of $1,500 for failure to attend to equipment during a pit stop, while Chip Ganassi Racing were fined $500 for the same offence, and KV Racing Technology have been fined $500 for passing over their own air hose. But on the other hand, IndyCar officials have withdrawn a $500 fine against the team for a crew member fueling without their visor down after a further internal review of the incident so what a race round barber and what a race to head into the month of may as well as in the championship we see montoya lead with 136 points three ahead of harry christian evers with scott dixon 123 new Godin up to four for 119 will power ending at the top with 112 points then it's james hinchcliffe and tony canon with 110 points graham ray with 103 simon Pajero with 96 and sebastian bordet rounds out the top 10 with 91 points and what a great lead in that Grand Prix of Alabama is into this year's month of May. One of the biggest months in all of motor racing and particularly on the Verizon IndyCar Series calendar. As yes, the month ends with the doubleheader weekend, the Chevrolet Jewel in Detroit and Belle Isle. But it's all about the races at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Of course, there's the big one on the oval. But before then, there's a race this weekend held round the road course. The Grand Prix of Indianapolis. So the Grand Prix of Indianapolis has only been around since last year when it had its inaugural event around the 2.439 mile kind of slightly modified course from the way F1 used to run it with 14 corners as it takes in part of the kind of MotoGP section at the end of its lap as it goes clockways round just like F1. And last year we saw a surprise pole position winner has Sebastian Savage got his only pole in IndyCar series racing after the fastest guy actually in qualifying ryan hunter ray with a 123.8480 he actually went to the puddle spun caused a red flag and so he got relegated to third on the grid behind jack hawks with the young british driver on the front row with surveyor unfortunately for the young colombian and his pole would mean now it as he stalled on the grid and this caused the likes of mikhail Eshkin and carlos munoz to run into the back of his car fortunately no one was hurt apart from i guess some bank balances after that but it was jack hawksworth who led most of the race with 31 laps out of the 82 as he was really impressive in his brian herter autosport car unfortunately due to strategy he would only finish seventh in the end as simon pagino grabbed the victory just ahead of ryan hunter over her question nevers sebastian bordet and charlie kimball rounding out the top five and this Grand Prix of Indianapolis is, you know, it's still an idea that's, you know, very new to kind of bring in this month of May. I kind of like it being this kind of, you know, warm up towards the main event of the Indianapolis 500 and all the festivities there. But I know some people kind of see this as a kind of pointless race just to, you know, fill out the calendar. It certainly was the case, you know, last year but i believe it can grow into its own event here and you know being a big part of the month of may going forward so for this year's event who we got to look out for to win the event well of course you got to look out for the likes of you know scott dix and all the all the chevrolet drivers basically you know you got to look 
out for, but yeah, particularly Scott Dix and the Penske lot, of course, Will Power, Harry Kushner, is one Pablo Montoya, maybe Simon Pagano, but yeah, as I said, he's been, he's got good pace in the qualifying, but just in the races where Penske seem to be pegged back as well, they got great, you know, won that pace, but over a race, they, you know, it's very much is a contest. And yeah, for Pagano, he, he's still, you know, he's got those, you know, it seems like jetting problems, you know, with coming to a new team and just figuring out how to, you know, go through a race without the excellent Rob Edwards on hand for him. And also, probably a dark horse here, maybe Jack Hawksworth in the AJ Foyt car. He's, as I said, he went really well last year with buying her to Warriors Sport, but if he can get even close to that, you know, maybe a top 10 finish, you know, that would be fantastic for him. But the guy to look out for, maybe for a win, apart from the other big lot is maybe Sebastian Bourdais for KV Racing. He's had a fantastic big start to the year. You know, he's up there in the top 10 of the championship and he's very consistent this year. So look out for him to maybe grab a victory here. Another French win round the Grand Prix of Indianapolis. But now we're on to the big one, the 99th running of the Indianapolis 500. Two and a half miles, 200 laps, between two and a half hours and three hours long this race. And that can change someone just from another driver to a legend in the IndyCar series. We saw that with Ryan hunter Ray last year as he snuck by Hedo Kashinevers in the closing laps, heading towards turn three, almost on the grass to grab victory. And what a win it was as he became one of those select group of drivers who have won the IndyCar series championship and the Indy 500. And the first American driver to do that since Sam Hornish Jr. back in 2006. And for Kashinevis, his long wait to join the elite group round Indianapolis continues into this year. Has the, the winning this drivers round here? There are three of them AJ Voigt, Al Unza, and Wick Mears. They have four wins round here, where Kashinevis has the most of the current lot with three wins. Will he become the fourth member of that elite group? Where we, oh, he was so close last year, you got to think he's one of the favourites again this year. Yeah, he always seems to be doing well round the oval. And the winner's team round here is also his team, Penske, with 15 wins. An incredible record round here for the captain. So heading into this year's Indy 500, there are so many teams and drivers to look out for. There have been so many teams and drivers announced as well in the past few weeks. With the likes of Euro Serbia confirmed at Rahul Lettman Lanigan, Racing as the 40 year old Spaniard drove with the team for four races last year, including the 500. Pippa Man is returning in pink at Del Coin Racing. Connor Daly is on a third Smith Peterson Motorsports car for the 500. And Townsend Bell, the NBC Sports analyst who turned 40 this year, well, he's returning to the 500 with Brian Reinbold racing in Kingdom Racing. And the most recent announcement for the 500 has been Alex Tagliani, who was working with Conquest Racing to get a car on the grid well that fell through and now he's in a third AJ Foyt car for the 500 and a nice striking livery I believe it's a tribute to Dan Gurney or rep here livery of Dan Gurney's car it's a nice nod to the great man there's also going to be an extra Chip Ganassi car on the, in the 500 field has Sage Carm's going to be in a number 8 until Sonoma but not this weekend at the Grand Prix of Indianapolis as he is sharing that seat with Sebastian Savager this year. Of course, we saw Savager take over that seat at Long Beach. He's taking over the seat this weekend in Indianapolis. And he's also going to be taking that seat at the finale of the season in Sonoma. But Savager's going to be in another Chip Ganassi car for the 500. That's five Chip, G Chip Ganassi cars on in the 500 field. That's the level of Andretti Autosport right there. But there's been one announcement that hasn't been made yet, and that's the driver in the second Dell coin car. Of course, that's been a kind of revolving door this year, particularly number 18 seat. Well, we've got Carlos Hurtis and Francesco Diaconi confirmed for the Grand Prix of Indianapolis. But for the 500, alongside Pippa Man, we've, looking, we've even had rumours of, say, Vitor Mira returning to the series. He was a run-up in the 500 with Panther Racing quite a few years ago. But also James Davison, the Australian who was a rookie with the team last year and drove a very competent 500. Well, maybe he will return to the team this year. But yeah, that's the one seat that's still up in the air. Of course, Dale Coyne, leaving it to the last minute as ever. So that only leaves us to predict who will win the 99th Indianapolis 
500 and it's a bit of an unknown quantity heading into the race as it's the first oval of the season and the first time we're going to see these super speedway aero kits go head to head with each other and it's again like Honda and Chevrolet have gone for different philosophies on their kits which is fantastic to see but on the first practice day last Sunday it certainly looked like they were a bit more even than they have been on the road courses and which is great to see and hopefully even though that practice day is kind of meaningless in the grand scheme of things hopefully it means that they are a bit more even in the great race and of course for this race we've got to look out for the big three teams Penske, Chip Ganassi and Andretti Autosport to win this and those cars from those teams they make up almost half of the field so that's quite a big barrier for the rest of the teams to you know work through to win this race but I believe there's one team to look out for especially and that is CFH racing of course they're off the back of a high after winning the Grand Prix of Alabama with Joseph Newgarden but their big weapon is Ed Carpenter the kind of team owner of Ed Carpenter racing or former team over Ed Carpenter racing but co-owner of CFH racing he's grabbed pole for the last two years in the Indy 500 unfortunately it hasn't worked out for him in the races in 2013 he spun late in the race when running well and last year he was just in an unfortunate instant when on a restart Tanson Bell went round his outside while James Hinchcliffe did, decided to make it free ride but going down his inside of course that's never going to end well and Hinchcliffe and Comte are out on the spot but Ed Comte is an oval specialist only races on the ovals this year only races on the ovals last year and he just looks very strong for this race he's one of the favorites for this race and have an, another American win it as well back to back that, that can probably only help the series I would guess and of course look at young Joseph Newgarden he's on a high after winning his first Verizon IndyCar race and always seems to kind of run well on the ovals now he seems to you know great have great pace but he's never never really materialized that into results early in his career but now he seems like he's growing on the ovals and yeah especially look out for him in the Indy 500 as well along with JR Hildebrand who was impressive in his only outing for Ed Calm to racing last year in the Indy 500 qualifying in the top 10 and finishing the top 10 last year look out for again another American there to look out for during this race but of course there are other teams to look out for you know AJ for yes Takuma Sato is a bit you know hit on miss but he, as he showed in the 2012 Indy 500, but he he was so close to winning that. Maybe he could come again with the Honda Aero kit. And, you know, there are guys such as Sebastian Borde have grown on these ovals. And with KVSH Racing, he's had a fantastic start to the year. And, yeah, maybe look out for him to challenge as well. But let me know in the comment section below who you think he will, will win the 99th Indianapolis 500. And we've got two more races, though, to preview in the month of May as the month ends with the only double header weekend of the season and that is in Berlin with the Chevrolet Jewel in Detroit. So the Chevrolet Indy Jewel in Detroit ends the month and it's the only double header weekend this year unfortunately has the other rounds such as Toronto has had to reduce it to a single race and Houston has just disappeared off the calendar all together but the 2.36 mile 3.8 kilometer circuit with 14 turns is a challenging street circuit and is now a unique weekend this season with a challenge for the drivers and the teams having this quick turnaround from you know saturday to sunday so if you have an issue on saturday you can make up for it on the sunday or if you had a big issue on the saturday you you know you have an even worse issue on the sunday there and i certainly hope we see more double header weekends return next year but this Bellar circuit has been on the calendar with a couple of different configurations since 1992 when it joined the Kart or Champ Car calendar and it was on the calendar until 2001. Then it joined the IndyCar series in 2007 and 2008 before disappearing again. But with the help of the captain, Roger Penske, it returned to the calendar back in 2012 and has become a doubleheader weekend since 2013. And it's certainly a successful venue for Penske as they have won the most times round this circuit while it's been on the American Open 
Will Canada with five wins and his driver Helio Neves is the winningest driver round this circuit with three wins including his first win in American open wheel racing round here back in 2000. He followed up with a win in 2001 and then his last and most recent win in the Verizon IndyCar series. His 29th win came here in the second race of last year's event and it was certainly a successful weekend for the captain last year. His, his Penske team won both races as Will Power won the first race just from Graham Ray Hall with Tony Conant for Justin Wilson fourth and Helio Castroneves in fifth but it was certainly a difficult start to the race for Australian as he made contact with Simon Pagano continuing their feud from last year as they went onto the back straight forcing the Frenchman into retirement. In the second race it was Power once again having some issues in the early part of the race he dived down the inside into the third corner and got himself a penalty and had to fight through the field finishing second in the end behind Castro Neves with Charlie Kimball third, Scott Dixon fourth and James Hinchcliffe in fifth. So for this year's race well the form guide is the first four races of the season so expect Chevrolet domination maybe Penske domination once again this year but hopefully we can see the likes of Andretti and Honda give a bit more of a fight now it's, it'd be interesting to see what kind of development they've done to their kind of road course aero kit during May of course the contrary and other things during that month but yeah it should be another exciting race round Belal has it was very exciting last year great action hopefully you know with these winglets on the cars there won't be too much you know pieces being everywhere too much cautions breaking up the flow of the race it will just be a nice race a bit like Long Beach but with a bit more action to it. Finally has all the news has been incorporated into the previews and reviews sections we're looking back around in the month of April for the Mazda Road to Indy the feeder series ladder to the Verizon IndyCar series and firstly there's some great news and then we're going to be looking back at what happened at Long Beach and in Alabama for the Indy Lights Championship and particularly looking at the rise of Spencer Pignot. Firstly, before I talk about the madness that happened in the Mazda Road to Indy last month, the great news that Michael Johnson, the Cape Motorsports driver, who crashed heavily into the turn three wall during St. Petersburg practice for the Pro Mazda Championship at the end of March. Well, he got released from hospital on the 15th of April and the Paradise Race as well on the road to recovery over all the various ailments he got from that accident, which he talks about in the racer article which was posted on Monday linked in the description below where he talks about you know the instant and his recovery since then and his aim of being back in a race car by mid June at the Toronto race and of course I'm wishing him well on his recovery and hopefully we will see him back in a race car very soon. So on to the Indy Lights Championship and covering its three races from April beginning with the race at Long Beach where Jack Harvey grabbed pole ahead of Carl Kaiser but the young American got a bit too excited into turn one on the first lap and took out Harvey and himself from proceedings leading to Ed Jones winning for Carlin once again three out of three for him to begin the season ahead of Spencer Pignett the Junkers driver who won the Pro Master Championship last yeah, he was very exciting during the race and made a fantastic move around the outside of Fix or was into turn nine and grabbing second ahead of the Puerto Rican with RC Anderson in fourth, a very impressive showing for the young American ahead of Max Chilton in fifth. And then they had two races at Alabama at the end of the month and Spencer Pignett grabbed pole for both races. They had the most laps in both races and Judy won both races has well in the first race he won ahead of Jack Harvey and RC Anderson grabbing his maiden podium in the Indy Lights Championship ahead of Ed Jones with Max Chilton running out the top five once again and then in the second race we saw Pignett win ahead of Harvey and Max Chilton who grabbed his first podium in the Indy Lights Championship ahead of Fix, Sorales and Scott Anderson rounding out the top five his best result of the season so far. So after that marvellous weekend in Alabama, Spencer Pignett leads the championship on 132 points, seven points ahead of Ed Jones, who suffered a puncher, I believe, in the second race in Alabama. And despite doing the fastest lap, he could only finish 11th in the end. Jack Harvey is third. The consistent Englishman has 112 points, 28 ahead of Max Chilton and fourth in the championship now after that good weekend in Alabama. And Felix Sarraz rounds out the top five with 78 
points. R.C. Anderson is set for a 75 points. Scott Anderson 7th for a 67 points. The same amount has Ron, who is in 8th. Cole Kaiser is 9th for 65 points. And Ethan Mangale rounds out the top 10 with 59 points. So it's on to the Pro Mazda Championship, which also had three races during the month of April with one at Nona Motorsports Park where Weir on Tan took pole for Andretti Autosport but the Malaysian was beaten to the check flag by Santiago Lula Atala of Team Pelfrey as the Uruguayan grabbed his first win of the season, his first win in the Pro Mazda Championship. Rounding out the podium was Timothy Barrett, the young Frenchman with Pato O'Ward grabbing the fastest out of the race on his way to 4th place, head of Florian the Tour rounding out the top 5. Then there were also two races in Alabama for the Pro Mazda Championship, and again it was Rio on Tan who took pole for both races, and in the first race he actually came through with the victory ahead of Barrett with Uratada rounding out the podium with Neil Alberico in 4th place after finishing 6th in Louisiana and with Pato Award rounding out the top five in the first race of Alabama. And then in the second race it was Tan who took the pole who took the pole but he was just aggressive on the even to the outlap and onto the rolled in start as he pushed the driver off, got a penalty for it. He pushed Barret off I believe, got a penalty for it and was just all over the place. Too aggressive during that race and he ended up 14th and you know he just lost his head during that race it seemed as Neil Albareco kept his and won the race ahead of Euro Tada with Garrett Grist rounding out the podium for his first podium of the season for the Canadian. In fourth place it was Will Owen as well with Florin the Tour rounding out the top five once again. So in the championship it's Neil Albareco leading the championship on 130 points eight ahead of Euro Tada. With Pato Ward up to third place now with 77 points, a point ahead of Tan. With Florian Latour rounding out the top five in the championship, actually with 74 points, a point ahead of his fellow Frenchman, Barrett. With Garrett Grist in seventh with 71 points. Jose Gutierrez down to eighth with 66 points after a dreadful weekend in Alabama. Will Owen up to ninth with 65 points. And Daniel Burkett rounding out the top ten after a pair of 10th place finishes and Alabama with 63 points. Finally, there's the USF 2000 Championship, which had four races during the month of April, with two of them at Nola Motorsports Park and two of them at Barber Motorsports Park. And it was Nico Jamin who grabbed pole for the first race in Nola, led the most laps, and Judy grabbed his first win of the season for Cape Motorsports ahead of his teammate Anand Tillis, who grabbed the fastest lap of the race with Jake Edison rounding out the podium ahead of Victor Franzoni and Jordan Lloyd the Australian rounding out the top five. In the second race at Noda it was Victor Franzoni who went on a tear and Julie grabbed his first win of the season for Afterburner Autosport ahead of Teliz and Jake Edison. In fourth it was Parker Thompson the Canadian and in fifth, it was Anthony Martin bouncing back after a terrible first race in Nola. At Barber Motorsports Park, though, it was Nico Jamming grabbing pole once again for Cape Motorsports, but it was his teammate, Anand Therese, who won the race ahead of Victor Franzoni, who led the most laps, who had the fastest lap, but just got passed in the end. It was Jake Edison rounding out the podium once again, very consistently young. American head of Anthony Martin and Parker Thompson, the Canadian. And the Canadian will once again round out the top five in the second race as Nico Jamin dominated, getting the fastest lap, leading the most laps and grabbing the win for Cape Motorsports ahead of Anthony Martin getting his first podium of the year ahead of Jake Edison, Anthony Tellez and as I said, Thompson rounded out the top five of the fit to Franzoni, finished fourth out on track, but was disqualified for a technical infringement with his car. But still, after all of those races in April, it is Edison who leaves the championship with 152 points, 11 ahead of Jamin. Tellez is third in the championship with 131 points, with Anthony Martin up to fourth in the championship with 104 points, six ahead of Franzoni. Parker Thompson is sixth in the championship with 88 points with German Kivan Andres Suri. Apologize, I said that wrong. Seventh in the championship with 76 points. No wonder he's got four seventh place finishes so far 
this season. Dofeng now is eighth in the championship with 70 points ahead of Garth Richards, who has 68 points, is ninth in the championship, along with Nikita Lavstokin. I apologize, I said that wrong. The Russian is 10th in the championship, also with 68 points. So during this month for the Mazda Road to Indy, all three series will have a couple of races on the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Road Course in support of the Grand Prix of Indianapolis. While the Indy Lights Championship goes on to the Freedom 100 and their race on the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, I guess you can get a more American name for a race. While the Pro Master and US F2000 Championship will go to the nearby Lucas Oil Raceway for their oval race. And after this month, I believe all four championships in this video will be at least halfway through their season. God, it goes by so fast nowadays. So that's all on the Cut of Horizon Indy Car Series and Master Road to Indy. For this month and of course I'm going to be back next month with another episode and catching up on what's no doubt going to be a jam-packed month of May and an equally jam-packed month of June to look forward to as well and don't forget it is IndyCar Series Awareness Month tell your friends tell your family tell your dog about this series and at least for one month of the year everyone will know what an IndyCar Series is but so now for watching and I will see you next month.